The International Park and Mobility Institute is pleased to present this shop talk titled University Shop Talk, Guiding Your Team to Serve Your Patrons. My name is Kenny and I'll be assisting the moderator for today's shop talk. If you need assistance at any time during today's program, please raise your hand or use the chat feature and we will assist you. Today's shop talk will last 60 minutes. Please feel free to queue up a question for us at any time in the chat during today's presentation. You can also turn your microphone and camera on to ask a question or make a comment. This shop talk will be available on YouTube in a few days. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Jennifer Dugas. Jennifer Dugas, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Kenny. Welcome, everybody. It's a, it's good to see everybody out there in, in Zoom land. Uh, this afternoon, we have a uh, esteemed panel put together, and I'll allow everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, but uh, for myself, I'm Jennifer Tugas, I'm the Assistant Vice President for Business Services at Western Kentucky University. Um, I came up through the parking world, first at the University of Georgia, and then um, here at WKU for uh, for 18 years, I believe. So um, a lot of time uh, working in the parking industry. And with that, I'll turn it over to Marlene. If you could uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then tag team the next person. Sounds good. Good afternoon. I'm Marlene Kramer. I'm the Director of Transportation and Parking Services at Cal Poly University here in San Luis Obispo, California. And I'll pass it to Michelle. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Porter. I'm the Director of Parking and Transportation Services here at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, PA. Been in the parking industry for about 19 years now um, and happy to be on the shop talk this afternoon. I'll pass the baton to Ray. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Raymond Mensa, currently the Assistant Vice President for Transportation here at DFW Airport. I know you're wondering what's the airport guy going on here. Um, but I've only been here three weeks now, uh, previously Director of Parking and Transportation Services at University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, and then prior to that, Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. So been in an industry 20 plus years, higher ed about 14 of those years. So glad to be here to have some conversations about um, the awesome world of parking. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Um, as you can see, we've got uh, quite a bit of experience here on the panel. And we'd love to make this as interactive as, as possible. So if there are any burning questions that you have, um, please go ahead and share them in the chat screen. We'll be monitoring that throughout the, uh, the presentation this afternoon. Um, but certainly want to make sure that, that this uh, shop talk kind of meets your needs. And it's really driven by, uh, by what your interests are. We will certainly begin the discussion um, and we may even ask a few questions of you, but um, certainly the goal here is to provide content and information that you're interested in hearing about. And so if there's something that's really important for you that you would like to touch on before we leave, please go ahead and, and uh, ask those questions during the chat box. Um, and also as we have our conversation, um, you know, would love for it to be interactive. And so if uh, one of our panelists is talking about something that's particularly interesting to you and you have a question, please feel free to jump in. Um, certainly shop talks, uh, the parking industry is a fantastic industry in that people love to share what they've done on their campus uh, and, or you know within their operation and, and how to make it better. We kind of all live in the trenches together and it's great to hear the experiences of our, our fellow parking travelers. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is begin um, with asking Marlene, um, before we jumped on to the shop talk, she was talking a little bit about some of the challenges that she's experiencing at Cal Poly. Um, um, part of that was move-in weekend and, and uh, getting ready to start classes tomorrow um, as she's on the quarter system. Um, and, and another part of that is is reacting to change and, and construction is one of those things that um, is a, a kind of a perpetual thing on university campuses. And so it's real important for us to be able to adapt to change um, as it comes along. So Marlene, keeping in, in, in context of the theme of today, which is kind of guiding your team to serve your patrons, when you experience change on campus, 
how do you um, help that? How do you help guide your team? How do you help lead the university through that change as you are preparing for um, parking, you know, as you see changes on campus? Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I think that what's that old phrase that goes, you know, the only thing that's constant is change. And on a university campus, I know a lot of us are experiencing a lot of construction and change in administration. We really, for the last uh, several years, have taken the focus of, of just being ambassadors to the campus. And that's on all levels of our operation, whether it's, you know, our our parking enforcement staff who rebranded re, re from parking officers to customer service specialists. We also have worked very hard with all our campus partners because we realized we couldn't do it alone. And so we work with university marketing and communication to get out these messages in terms of changes on campus, what's going on, uh, for example, we have a big construction project right now at our and our campus library is closed. And so since last spring, we have been working with campus to send messages about that project and how it was going to affect parking and what we were doing to respond to that changes in shuttle stops, really just trying to get ahead of the frustration that we know tomorrow's my first day of school so tomorrow the tidal wave hits uh, but really trying to get ahead of that and one of the things that we've done and be, be successful like I said is working with those campus partners to really help us be our advocate that means building a lot of relationships and having a lot of communication with the campus partners and having some frank discussions like, hi, why did you put that volleyball tournament on move-in day? You know? <laughs> uh, and, and some, but what that does is it reinforces that we want the patron, we want our customers, we want our students, we want our staff, faculty to have a good experience. That's the whole intention. And it's not just going to happen with parking signage and messaging. It, it needs to come from all sides of the campus so that we're one united front in delivering that service and showing that quality customer service is a priority for the whole campus. So that's kind of, that's what we've done. A lot of, we've done that uh, rebranding as well of the department so that we are more in line with the university's marketing and branding before, and I and say before was prior 2015, I, I'm within, you know, parking is within public safety. And I report to the chief of police. And historically, parking was just an extension of police. And so we, in that rebranding of the department, we wanted to show, yes, we're within public safety. However, our model of service is different. We're, uh, and, and, and police are gonna be ambassadors as well, but the, with the service that we provide within parking, we can take it to different levels in terms of connections with the staff on a very positive note. So changing, we, we changed the vehicles, the way they were logoed. We changed uh, uniforms. They said we reclassified the employees. It was a complete rebranding that we did to show that we were we were just an extension of the university and all the services that the university provides versus being a more punitive um, law enforcement extension, lack of a better word, of, of the university. Any questions on that? The other thing that I wanna add is with the reclassification of our parking officers, that has actually made our recruitment a lot easier and better. Before we, you know, you'd see the posting parking officer, right? Even though they were doing all those very important customer service ambassador roles already, but it was being lost, people weren't even considering it. 
now being customer uh, service specialists, people are interested and people see that they give us a second chance. Um, obviously, it's a very uh, you know, hiring is very challenging. We're all competing with local companies and all that. And so having that also gave us a, a career ladder and a way for our staff to qualify for other positions as well. And we've seen, we don't like to lose our officers. A lot, a lot of them have stayed, but we've have actually had some really great success stories with people moving on to other roles on campus. And I would say they, they've had a better opportunity because of that reclassification and what the roles, uh, what they could do. We could assign them more special projects within that role as well, which was very good for the employee and their experience. That's interesting. Thank you, Marlene, for that. Um, Michelle, um... I see a comment from Ray Valdez. We are also softening the title of our parking enforcement officers at Emory University. Uh, the effect on uh, recruiting is expected to be the same. Ray, would you like to elaborate at all? Hello, everybody. I didn't really want, want to add too much more to that because they don't report to me right now, so I don't have you know all the details. I just know that that's been discussed um, within Emory, and they do... Uh, here report to the um, to more of the, the the permitting and enforcement, you know, of of the parking side versus uh, the police department. Ray, what kind of uh, uh, staffing challenges are you experiencing in Atlanta? Um, I, I think you know we we haven't had a lot of turnover in that department. However, you know the comments have been made that that's. Um, it makes it harder to bring people in because they think they have to have an enforcement background. Um, so we're looking to fill one more role um, and we're hoping to find somebody internally within the, the community, the Emory community who's willing to, you know, step up and take that role um, with the softer title, softer, uh, you know, the more consumer uh, advocate kind of role. Right. Does anybody have a a training program they would like to share with the group or talk about how you train when you bring in a, a new employee and prepare them to, to go out, whether it's, you know, interact on the front staff or um, go out in the field and, and prepare for those, um, how to be an ambassador for campus or, or how to de-escalate situations? Anybody want to talk about any kind of training program you have? Quiet. Michelle, can you speak a little bit to some of the things that you're seeing at Carnegie Mellon and and uh, what did, what you do with your staff to help them, you know, through the challenges that you see? Sure. Um, so what we are experiencing is similar to what Martin talked about with construction and. Um, hiring challenges. Uh, we did. We had some turnover during COVID, but um, more so for us, what's happening is we are experiencing um, changes in the, the real estate on campus, where the university is actually selling off some of their real estate, which includes parking. Um, so some of the challenges that I'm facing is having to move people around, and we have, you know. 2,500 parking spaces for almost, you know, 30,000 people on campus. So you do the math. Um, <laughs> it, so ev every day um, brings something new here. Uh, currently, I have 150 people that I have to try to reassign, and I just do not have the space for them. Um, so we're trying to think of creative ways in which we can partner with, you know, um, parking areas ar around the school. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is, is in, a, in a city area and we abut, you know, three other universities, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Duquesne University, Chatham College, um, Carlo, all of those colleges are, are right in the same um, area. And so we're, we're, 
you know, land challenged with purchasing any type of other land to be able to move people around. Um, we've resorted to having parking not on campus and having people park off campus and shuttle in, which is another problem. Um, people do not want to add time on their commute to be moved to other areas. Um, one of the things we do here, uh, as far as, you know, my team in preparing ourselves for, you know, the customers that are going to come in or come through very angry is we try to have uh, a powwow, <laughs> um, whether that's once a week, whether that's, you know, uh, twice a month, we get together, we talk about whatever issue, you know, we, I let everyone you know, have the round table and go around with an issue and, and how we could better serve, you know, that customer. We can't have a customer come in angry and we fire back and be angry at them. I'm sure everyone on this call has already heard that, but I feel that effective communication on both ends is a way to keep down um, confrontation. It's a way to, to allow that customer to leave your office just a little bit um, calmer than they did when they came in. Um, so our powwows, we kind of write down you know, three or four things that we think that could have been done or could be done, can be done or can be incorporated into our, um, you know, our daily routine to make our office just, you know, like Marlene said, to be that ambassador of the university. Could you talk a little bit about the process that you go through and the communications that you have with the customers that are affected by change? Sure. Um, so up until I would say about a year ago, may maybe two years ago, um, we would just communicate via email um, to all of our customers. Now we have our division hired a communications manager. And so I work with her on a monthly basis just to talk about changes that are coming down the pike and we do a really good effort of putting things in our uh, student or not, well, student and faculty and staff um, communication that goes out uh, twice, a, it goes out twice a month. And so we're really good at crafting messages that will um, focus on whatever changes we're going through. Uh, so we work with the communications manager, we, we work on drafts. Um, we run that by not only our uh, marketing and communications department, we also run that through our um, executive management team to make sure there isn't anything that they want to add to it. Um, it seemed to help a lot, and I don't know if anyone else is experiencing this, but instead of leading our communications always with parking, we try to lead it with something positive. Um, and try to focus on, um, I don't know, transportation as a whole. So we're, we're actually in the process of uh, rebranding and renaming. Um, we are currently parking and transportation services. Um, and we want to change our name possibly to transportation and, and parking or, or mobility services or something like that. So we're currently going through that process of um, figuring out what, what our name change will be. But um, yes, working with our communications manager is how we effectively um, communicate to our customers what's going to happen. We also have um, community texts. So it's a, that texting service that uh, you can update customers on a lot change. Um, you know, if a, a lot's going to be closed or, you know, for a day or if it's going to be closed for construction or a football game or something like that. So we get those messages out. Um, to people before they get to campus or before it happens so that they're prepared. Thank you. Any any questions for Michelle? I think um, one of the common themes is, you know, coordination and communication. Um, you know, there's so many things that go on on a college campus and, and parking and transportation being integral to that. Um, a lot of times when people are scheduling events and Marlene referenced um, scheduling a major volleyball tournament in the middle of move-in day, it's like left hand's not talking to the right hand. Um, 
you know, Marlene has mentioned that there's a, a campus group that meets, you know, to kind of have that that coordination meeting. And that's that's certainly a, a best practice. Is anybody else um, doing any kind of coordination across campus for, um, you know, in support of, of events across campus or, or just campus planning and um, any of that? All quiet. I'll jump. I'll, I'll jump back in just for myself. Um, we also have a parking and transportation advisory board. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that most most people have those, but we've been really really adamant about making sure that we have um, representation from all areas of campus. Um, you know, police, dining, student activities, um, just anything we could think of. We try to have a representative so that they can actually communicate that information. So the information comes from, you know, sometimes the the top down. Um, and, and that's helped us get our messages across as well when it comes to rate changes. Um, I don't know if any campuses, I'm sure you've all experienced um, the spin uh, uh, motor, not motorcycles, what are those um, scooters, scooters coming to campus? So we've had some changes there um, that have taken place that we've had some really good support from having that group on our team. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, having yeah, that advisory I'll, committee is really helpful. Raymond? No, no, I was just going to say, yeah, so at, at USF, we did things, you know, we had a few um, different methods of trying to get, you know, communication across. So one thing for sure that we did is what we call our road show. So we would, you know, put together a presentation of any big projects or any changes coming on, and then we would do what we call a road show, right? So we'll go visit the faculty senate, so the group that represents all the faculty, staff senate, all the groups, the group that represent all the staff, employees, student government. And so we'll set up, you know, time with those groups, present all the changes, answer questions, and, you know, try to get them to help us spread the word and spread the message, get their buy-in. Um, I think a lot of times when information is coming from peers or representative um, groups, it's tend it, the groups tend to accept it a little bit more than parking coming in and telling them this is what's happening, this is what's changing. Um, so we found that to be very helpful. Um, we also did what we call parking pop-ups. So we would choose a location, um, you know, on a monthly basis or based on, you know, availability of staff, of course. So we'll set up a tent in high traffic areas. So whether it's in front of the library, in front of the business school, anywhere where we have a lot of foot traffic, set up a tent, set up a table, um, you know, huge parking and transportation um, signage that says, hey, come ask us questions. What are your challenges? And sometimes we'll even pick a parking lot that may be a challenging lot uh, where people are, who are getting a lot of complaints. And we'll just post up there, set up our tent, set up some information, give out some swag and just have people come by and, you know, ask questions, give us their complaints. And sometimes they have valid complaints that things that we wouldn't normally think of. Um, we also use a lot of social media, especially as it related to students. So we hired a, a student um, that's, you know, within the marketing uh, the college. And, you know, they're, they're pretty well tuned into what students pay attention to, where they go. And we don't only send out messaging when there's something coming. We send out tips during the, you know, during the week. Hey, do you know you can do this? Or do you know you can use this mode of transportation? Or do you know we have this available? Because what we found is, you know, a lot of folks weren't aware of, you know, the different programs we offered, uh, the different features, the different types of permits. So I think just using that as more educational and informational, that way you keep them engaged and they keep checking um, those sites or the Instagram page or whatever the case may be, and it doesn't go stale. So that way, when we push out information with a lot getting closed or construction coming, they actually see it and pay attention because they're used to seeing things pop up and we make it cool. You know, we do cool little things that catch their attention and I make it that still this lot will be closed park here, you know, like make it make it more exciting, I guess you could say. 
Um, and then recently, just before I left, we worked closely with our emergency management group that had contacts throughout the university um, just to publish an event. So the goal is to eventually move to a centralized event management calendar for the entire university. But as you know, that's a challenge with getting everyone to buy in and sign on. But everyone pays attention to emergency management. So they put together something where we feed it all into them and then they send it out um throughout the university so then folks pay attention to what's coming out it's not coming from just parking so just a few things that we did um to try to get the messaging out of course you know your normal signage and stuff like that but um getting the message out through the different representative groups actually going out there meeting with them answering questions pushing the information out long you know if it's a big project we push it out long before the project starts so they are aware it's coming they are aware of the impact they may not be happy but you know what they've been informed they know it's coming it's just not something that sprung up on them and then that's when people get upset so we found that to be pretty successful um just using those different methods of communication um to push information out um just engaging the community um, treating it like this is a small city, a little town or something where you're getting out and, and kind of socializing what's coming. The smaller items, we just use social media, email, signage. Um, and even at those presentations, if we know those events are coming, we'll mention that, hey, we have a big concert in two weeks. So we're going to be shutting down this area as we normally do. So just prepare yourself for it. And so when they see that come out, We've kind of teased it already. And um, so, yeah, so we found those, those to be pretty helpful. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, any questions for Raymond? I think you covered a lot of good material there in terms of being very proactive about moving out into the community and, and you know, getting feedback directly from people and, uh, and pushing, pushing some messages out through other groups. You know, certainly universities, um, you know, that shared governance is an important piece of, of universities. So having a presence at the Faculty Senate, Staff Senate, and Student Government Association, those are all very good venues for um, reaching the campus community at large. Any questions or comments for Ray? Mm -hmm. Tia, you mentioned that uh, Ohio University has a major events committee that transportation and parking services is represented on. Could you share a little bit more about that? Sure. Yes. So um, similar to what everyone else has shared, you know, we, we've we developed a kind of wide network of partnerships that we communicate with. Um, and one of the issues that we have um, experienced on campus is just coordination of events because we do not have centralized scheduling. Um, and uh, so we have a major events committee. Transportation and parking has had a part on that committee for close to a decade, but we are actually reinventing that committee as a university this year. Um, and we meet um, every two weeks. Um, it's a large group of um, individuals from the university, it includes um, the police department, includes representatives from um, uh, student orgs, campus recreation, anywhere, athletics, anywhere that would be hosting events, academic um, related functions. There's representation and appointment on an annual basis to that committee. Um, and we are now meeting bi-weekly to talk about any events that are happening um, that could create challenges because we know from a parking perspective, something that might be a major event, um, obviously that's going to rise to that being a problem. But what we often have is clusters of small events that if you looked at those events independently, you may not think, hey, that's a major event and it's going to be problematic. Um, but once you add, you know, three or four of these events on the same green um, and you only have so many parking resources, that becomes a little bit more challenging to manage. So we're starting to really look at it from a, a more um, micro lens in regards to campus events and ways that we can be proactive. And I think it's it's been really successful so far um, as the university is working to implement and, and advocate for some more centralized scheduling resources. Um, but that representation is, is pretty um, large um, and it gives us also outlets and venues to share, you know, 
important information as it relates to parking and transportation, which is the first experience of those people as they're arriving to campus and making sure that they're understanding, you know, if you want to have a successful event, here are some of the things that you need to to do and developing those partnerships where we can communicate. Um, and we're using a lot, leveraging a lot of communications with our students and our parents um, as well in various communication channels. So um, that's been um a really good thing for us to participate in. And um, there's been a lot of changes coming to that committee, but they're exciting changes, I think, to help us. Thank you for sharing. I think you touched on something, I think that that's really important, which is, you know, when you have these coordination meetings, you know, the ultimate goal is the experience of the guests, you know, and, you know, and for a university, you know, that experience in the parking world, you know, can um, that can set a good tone for the day or can leave a bad taste in the mouth at the end of the day. And, and all of that leads to what the reputation is and the desire of somebody to, to come back to campus. Um, and one of the things that I forgot to mention, but that has been successful out of this major events group is that each, because we don't have centralized scheduling right now, each of these groups are sort of taking reservations for space or reservations for events in different ways. So we've developed some key questions that are being asked in many of those areas on forms for reservations related to, do you need parking? Do you need transportation? You know, our R's are asking, are you going to have inflatable set up? Are you going to have food trucks? You know, all of those things that we may know will trigger involvement with a another department. And so that gives us the ability and it gives a little bit um, more transparency into a department that might be taking an event and realizing, oh, okay, they needed food, they needed recycling, they needed parking. Um, these are things that that we need to make sure um, that we have centrally coordinated. So that's been really good. And we're developing um, some forms for external partners as well. Um, and then we have developed some resources um, that are still kind of in the, the draft format right now, but that just help people to understand, especially student organizations, how do we put those pieces together? Because it can be confusing to navigate the process because you do have to reach out to multiple different departments to coordinate things. And we're trying to make that process more seamless as well. Thank you, Tia. Um, that all sounds very exciting, um, you know, for for Ohio University. Um, as we think of other areas um, in in the parking and transportation services realm, um, Michelle, you mentioned spin um, a little bit. Micro mobility is certainly. Um, one of those services that, you know, can help with mobility across campus. Um, what's been your experience with bringing in or identifying um, what service would be important to bring to campus to serve the campus better and, and what that process has been to, to both identify and then, and then implement um, a new service to serve the campus community? Well, for us, spin was kind of thrown at us. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, city of Pittsburgh or D Domi, they actually deployed spin here in Pittsburgh in, I want to say, April um, of last year and didn't inform any of the colleges or universities, didn't give us a seat at the table to talk about it. But I wanted, I knew that that was important to our students. And so I reached out to SPIN to say, hey, you know, these, you know, um, scooters have been deployed in, in the city and we were finding them all over the place on campus just because the students weren't really using them. They didn't give them any education around, you know, just dropping this program um, in the city. And so... We reached out to them to develop a relationship because we knew that our students wanted to use them. Um, and SPIN came to the table. We actually found uh, some places here on campus where students could park them. Um, we did a geofencing map of the campus so that students would actually be charged. 
if they didn't drop them off within that um, within that area. And it was really important for us to make sure that we had a relationship with them. Um, suffice to say, Spin is actually has actually removed all of their um, scooters from the city of Pittsburgh. I just got an email the other day that I guess uh, Spin and one of the other um, scooter companies have joined forces. And so, um, you know, I, we'll have a conversation with them as well to let them know how important it is for us to um, have the have the scooters on campus, but have them within reason. So, you know, for me, it was parking. It was our construction development um, department, as well as our facilities department that all sat down together and talked with SPIN so that we could develop an agreement that they were, uh, you know, adherable to in order for their, their bike, their uh, scooters to be here on campus. And we'll do the same thing with the new vendor. Raymond, I think I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, you know, as we take a look at the services that we offer to our patrons and, and really this webinar is how do we serve our patrons better and how do we guide our team um, to help serve our patrons? What, so what's the process that you follow to identify and then implement services, you know, starting, um, including whatever training you might have for your staff for that? Um, are you referring to new services or improving services or enhancing services or just bringing in something new? Oh, it could be any of the above. Pick one <laughs> <laughs> or two. <laughs> well, I would say for us, the, the key piece is, you know, whenever you're introducing something new, first you have to get the buy-in, right? So buy-in and, of course, with your team, ensuring that they're part of the process. Um, so one thing we've done, you know, especially big projects, an example, you know, when we were transforming to at USF to virtual permits, um, we had, we put together, um, what I would call a task force and, you know, this one, you know, from line level employees to supervisors to be part of the process, because as you start bringing something like that in new, there are several concerns, there are rumors, you know, we're going to lose our job, they're automating. So all these things come up where once you bring the team together from a line level employee all the way up to a supervisor and system manager or, or a manager level and, and have a chairperson that manages the group, um, they're all part of the process. They're part of making the decisions. They're part of guiding you know, from a leadership standpoint, you guide them in, in the direction that they need to go into, but they they pretty much come up with a plan. So they're part of the plan and they've bought into the plan. Same with the customer, you know, pushing the information out to these different groups, like I mentioned before, going out there, being in front of it, getting them to be part of it, getting them to provide their ideas. And, you know, everybody on the university campus is a renowned researcher, professor, they got all the answers to everything. So they can tell you how to run parking. But um, or they have to something the... ready to help you run it. As if there <laughs> exactly. isn't something we could buy, they already they've developed something that can they help you run it better. It better. Exactly. <laughs> so so we we try to get the buy in there. We try to get in the buy in from our stakeholders, whether it's the planning department, design and construction you know, the project management team, all those IT, um, all those groups that are going to be part of that process or that project, we try to pull them in as early as we can, as early in the conversation as we can to be part of the process. Because typically, you know, we've made our mistakes in the past or we found out in the past, you know, once the project is going and then you pull in a, a group, they're like, well, why didn't you think about this? You should have done that. You should. So we bring them all in at the start and everybody's part of that process and everybody's part of building that change or being part of that change. I think it goes a long way. You're of course never gonna agree on everything. Everybody has you know, their own piece that they try to protect and ideas that they try to push. But I think it helps and it has helped in projects that we've seen that involving those different stakeholders 
um, you know, even with the employees to be part of the process has made a huge difference because they become part of it, right? So now they can't just point fingers at well, we weren't told and we weren't involved and you guys did this and no, you were all part of it and we all built this together and we're going to work through the challenges together and we're going to try to figure this thing out. So I think, you know, introducing anything new that's that's been helpful and that even goes to, you know, external partners that, you know, that may be within the area that may be impacted. You try to pull them in and ensure that they're aware and they're part of the process. So, and, you know, a lot of th times we don't have all the answers or know all the different scenarios within each area. So they can bring those perspectives, highlight those challenges, highlight those impacts. Um, and, you know, it, it helps. Not that it's 100% a smooth process, but it definitely helps to, to introduce anything new or, or take on a new project or changes or anything like that. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely. I think a common theme from today is building those relationships across campus, you know, whether that's event coordination or implementing change. Um, you know, we are certainly not a silo and, and it, it it does, um, it's an important part of what we do to build those relationships on uh, across campus so that um, we can move the university in the direction, you know, that helps it be successful. Uh, there's a question from Lisa Madeira uh, to Michelle, um, and she's asking uh, specifically about rules and regulations for having scooters on campus. Oh, and you, do you... Um, do I would, you I just, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Yeah, I did just, we, I, I was talking about the spin uh, scooters. Um, like I mentioned, the scooters were deployed here through our um, city, through our Domi office. Um, they were deployed in the city. So what, what we did is we don't give, we didn't give anyone any type of citation or anything. Um, our policy just stated, because we don't have, we don't have the manpower to do that. Um, I mean, when they deployed those things, they were everywhere on our campus. So it was important that we did something. We did something pretty quickly um, in order to have some type of control over them. Um, they are allowed on the campus. They're not supposed to go. Um, so what SPIN did is anyone that rented it or anytime this, the scooter came within a certain radius of the campus, um, there would be, I guess there was some type of control that they had or that spin had on the scooter that would control the speed of it. So it wouldn't go over, I want to say like eight miles per hour or something like that, um, while it was it within that geo fence of CMU's campus. So that that's that's the one of the only things we did to really control. Um, because it's hard to stop these kids. These kids ride around on campus on if not spin scooters, they have their own scooters. They have, um, they have the, uh, was that the skateboards are back now, skates. So they're just zipping around here on everything. <laughs> yeah, we had similar, we were able to throttle. Um, we had wheels they got bought out by a company over in Europe and, and they disappeared when that merger happened. So mergers in the micro mobility market continue to, uh, um, and to go along. Um, and the other thing we were able to do was to uh, geofence the parking. And so, you know, if the vehicle was not parked at a bike rack area or a designated parking area, then uh, the charges would continue, you know, until it was returned to uh, a different spot. Um, Tia, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was just going to mention that on our campus, um, so we are kind of combined with the city, but we have a process where it's a dual permit process. So they still have to pay fees to the city for operation. They pay university fees, but the university and city will not approve to have shared mobility vendors um, unless they have received sign off from both parties. The university has much more stringent policies on use, but the city has agreed that they're in, if they are in violation, um, that then we would determine 
whether we would still operate within the city or not. So we developed a pretty strong partnership um, and we've been able to pretty effectively manage it. We've, we've got a new vendor that's been doing a pretty good job in that space, but um, we do have a lot more um, uh, policies in place, but it's linked in with the cities too. So if they're in violation of any of those things, they would get pulled from both locations simultaneously. So that helps us um, in many instances. What university are you from? Ohio University. Tracy, you have your hand up. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to um, chime in on the spin um, talk about uh, regulations. I, I I originally was from the University of Central Florida, and I just recently transferred to the University of North Florida. So I'm new in my position here, but when I was at UCF, we um, spin scooters was um, a program through the Student Government Association. And they actually, as far as the rules go, we did have rules in our regulations there. You know, you can't be on sidewalks, um, but they also do uh, safety measures as well. Like they would come in and if you attended one of their um, safety um, sessions, they would give you free credits for rides. Um, they were also giving out bike helmets. Um, they also, if they have repeat offenders who are not um, following their regulations, then they put them on a, a no rent list. So they want, they're not gonna be able to rent it next time. So we found that most effective and actually, <laughs> we, um, as a pedestrian campus, we had a lot of uh, students bringing their own scooters on campus too. And surprisingly enough, when we've had accidents with um, scooters and vehicles, nine times out of 10, it's a personal scooter than a spin scooter. So I just think that's another safety issue as well that when they can regulate the speed of their scooters. Thank you. Um, we also have a comment from Brandon Pataka at the City of Omaha, um, who says, we work with Crichton University and um, University of, uh, you're going to have to fill in the rest of that for me, um, here in Omaha to geofence the campus off to not allow for rides or parking within the university properties. And he's happy to speak with anybody about the process that they used. Brandon, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, hi, I'm Brandon Batushka, City of Omaha Parking Division. Um, I oversee the scooter program here. So, they we had Spin and Lime come in about 2019. This is our fifth full season. Originally, we worked with both UNO and Creighton to geofence off their campuses. So, we have no ride zones within the campus, also no parking zones around them. We use a different model for charging. So, we have quote unquote free, it's our green zones around all of our parking garages and designated bus stops where there's no fees charged to any of the scooter companies for parking. Around the Creighton campus, for example, we have what's considered a high zone because Creighton didn't want them parking the scooters on the sidewalks, even though it's allowed everywhere else in the city, just allowed to, to foot traffic. Creighton's a pretty, pretty big campus here downtown. And so that zone, the scooter companies do a pretty good job of keeping their scooters out of there because they don't want to incur those extra fees for parking. And then the whole city in general is considered a medium zone. And so we charge by the minute where scooters are parked and we also have a fee um, per ride. And so we kind of have like a, a tiered structure here. It's worked great. We go out every year, you know, we they the scooters leave for the winter because it gets cold. They come back in the spring. We test the geofences. We don't have any problems with them. And so there's been a pretty, pretty good spins no longer here. So we only have one provider now line um, spin pulled out last year at the end of the season just due to market share. So, um, but I'm willing to, you know, work with anybody. We use GIS to build our our back end geofences and then send those out to them through either API or just uh, whatever form they want, GeoJSON maps or, you know, shared files, so. Thank you, Brandon. I think, it, you know, a town and gown relationship there, a city university relationship is a common theme with those uh, scooters. We have the, the same here at WKU. We had a failed attempt early and and that was because it was all restricted to campus and you can't have a viable business model you know when your students are gone for you know 16 18 weeks out of the year um so we partnered with the city and and we're getting ready to uh and go for a new rfp i believe um for services um coming up josh Cantor um has made a comment that he just came back from an event 
they did with bird and lime, same as many others where they gave away helmets and promoted safety. Some of the others have dual contracts in our neighboring city um, with no ride zones and, and scooter corrals. Working with the ADA office on marketing about accessibility awareness, focusing on scooters, bikes, skateboard, and personally owned scooters. So, so it's recognizing that micro mobility. Um, I like that that addition of incorporating the ADA office with that. Josh, you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I mean, like many of you all, it's kind of a. Uh, a work in progress. Um, like I said, we we meet on a regular basis with our vendors. We've had Spin and others at times, but we we had a cap on how many scooters they can have, and we just divide them up to, to between how many vendors we have. Um, and so, but yeah, you know, ADA office came to us asking us what we can do, and not realizing that we already kind of do a lot of marketing and. The vendors have actually been pretty pretty good to work with. Uh, I think I went and went like many of you all with a lot of apprehension, but um, you know they they have been pretty responsive. But you know again the hard part is I'm like parking enforcement right where we can hold the the person accountable. It's very difficult to hold the person who uses scooter accountable. Um, so you know that's so we're kind of trying to focus on the educational piece per se. Um, but like I forgot who mentioned if it was UTA. Like the reality is they're here. They're not going away, you know, and again, even if bird and lime go away, you know, there's enough people with their own scooters and stuff like that. And, it's, you know, it's a struggle enough just to keep keep them out of buildings from a fire safety um, you know, perspective. Um, so, you know, the reality is you just have to kind of try to control it to the best of your ability. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we're coming up at at, uh, you know, Closing in on our hour here, and, and there is a question on the chat. Has anyone, um, this is from Jason Schultz from Modi. Um, has anyone deployed a parking app and how has it worked? And then Ray Valdez respond that they use the flash parking app. Um, works great for those who misplace hang tags or who have other challenges with, with tag reading. Um, Ray, would you like to talk a little bit more about what you're doing? Um. Sure, I can talk briefly. I just uh, another one of those things that doesn't fall directly under me, but uh, you know, I'm working with uh, more of the facility side of uh, parking assets. But we've certainly seen a lot of success with the Flash parking app because you know people who come from apartment complexes or somewhere else where they may already have tags stuck to their vehicle, and it causes misreads with our system. Well, this app gives them just you know a a lot more secure way to get into the decks without having to wait, you know, for the system to read their their tag, or if they misplace or, or lose their tag. So it's it's really worked out well for us. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, Kenny, I think I'll, I'll turn it back to you. I'll, I'll thank our panel. Um, Marlene and, and Raymond and Michelle, thank you for uh, for leading our discussions today. I'm glad we had some good interaction um, and uh, found some topics that people were interested in. And Kenny, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And I thank you to Jennifer moderating today's panel. Thank you everybody for joining us today for today's Shop Talk. Uh, that's the end of our program today. We hope we have a very wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Thank everybody. you. Thank you.